Okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the webinar, Your Healing and Recovery Journey with Cancer, Strategies for Maintaining Mental Health, Wellness, and Resiliency. I'm Teresa Blondin, the National Volunteer and Program Manager here at Bladder Cancer Canada. And I'm so happy that you're all taking some time to care for your own mental well-being tonight. I'd like to introduce my colleague on the call, Shasa Boshoff, our National Development Manager. Thank you for being here, Shasa. At Bladder Cancer Canada, we believe that education empowers patients and can help facilitate an increased quality of life for people affected by bladder cancer. And that's what tonight's session is all about. And please remember that these webinars contain content intended for the sole purpose of information sharing and should not be considered medical advice. Always talk to your doctor or urologist about what is best for you. And if you run into any issues, myself and Shasa are monitoring the chat and we're happy to help. So now I am honored to introduce our presenter for the evening. Sonia McMahon Comartin has worked in the mental health and wellness roles within the public sector for over 20 years, assisting with a multitude of people of all ages. She has been with the Canadian Mental Health Association in Windsor-Essex County since 2016 and transitioned from her role as bereavement educator to mental health educator in March of 2022. Sonia has a diverse experience offering both wellness and bereavement services, as well as coordinating and facilitating a multitude of loss specific grief support groups. Thank you so much for being here and I will pass it over to you now, Sonia. Hello everyone and welcome and thank you so much, Teresa, for that. It's always uh, interesting, I guess, hearing about our, ourselves out loud once we provide a bit of a bio, but thank you so much for that introduction as well as inviting me. Um, I'm now more familiar with Bladder Cancer Canada and I'm, uh, you know, grateful for that because each of us has our own journeys for ourselves, our family members, our, our friends. So, uh, Thank you for the work you do. And certainly, Teresa, I also want to acknowledge not only your invitation, but your patience as um, CMHA Windsor Essex. I think we're quite known in our uh, community and beyond, and we love what we do, but we've certainly had a great deal of presentation. So um, your patience as we've uh, organized all this has been super appreciated. So everyone, wherever you're um, you know, joining from, I saw some pop up on the screen that uh, you know some of you are within Ontario, where I'm from, some of you, I think I saw Manitoba, Saskatchewan, et cetera. So wherever you're joining from, again, welcome. Um, I think you can see me well. I'm trying to get uh, the sun not as uh, vibrant on my screen. I'm, I'm having a bit of a hard time, but um, certainly also don't want to complain about the, the beautiful sunshine. So again, I hope that's, uh, that's okay. This small office just has lots of windows. So I will get started with the content for the presentation that has uh, been developed that I made specifically for tonight. And I hope that it resonates well with you, um, no matter, you know, what your experience is. And this may be, you know, you personally that has had a diagnosis, this may be a loved one, whatever standpoint, you know, you're experiencing, um, maybe it's the uh, professional reasons, perhaps, uh, no, just personal interest. Whatever that is, I do hope that you have at least some what I like to call golden nuggets of information that are either new or perhaps reminders. Um, you know, certainly the mental health field is something that uh, we know needs to be looked at, really addressed in combination with our physical health. Right? It's not just one or the other. It's it's definitely interconnected in so many ways. So as I was preparing, like I said, I learned um, some things. I've just had limited exposure with bladder cancer. That was my father's um, initial diagnosis. And, uh, you know, but I think I've done even more learning now. So I will offer what I can. As Teresa mentioned, we'll have questions near the end that uh, whether it's appropriate for myself or, or Teresa or someone else to answer, we'll just um, be with that. So for our learning objectives tonight, um, the, the well-rounded uh, you know, piece of what I want to, to go through here to provide 
you know, various insights and perspectives. I'm going to go into, you know, mental health itself, understanding that, as well as resilience and stress, right? We talk about, we refer to these things, we don't always kind of dive in and give a lot of thought what we're really talking about. So just uh, a bit of time on that, as well as, uh, you know, our daily tasks and uncertainties that we do face, and especially from the lens of when there is a cancer diagnosis. Finding balance, what that might look like for you and healthy coping strategies, these two, as well as taking care of yourself. I'll offer some ideas and insights, and I certainly hope that what I provide, maybe some of them you'll take and think, yes, I want or need to try that, or I used to do that and I've kind of fallen off, or it might cause you to actually think of something else, right? like a springboard that, um, you know, I'm giving you a bit of a foundation, but you further with what works for you. Because as we know, with any wellness journey, right, our lifelong navigating, it is very individual. No quick fix when we go through challenging situations. There's no, you know, one size fits all or recipe. But uh, I hope there's value in what I'm sharing and you take what you need to from it. So we know that like physical health, we do all have mental health. And there's characteristics that really make up, right, that determine um, what our mental health really consists of, what it's all about. So we're talking about our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, and our moods. And I'd like you to just think about for a moment, and, and some of this will be just time for you to be introspective, right? To reflect on your own self. You know, if you were to pause and think, you know, how mentally fit am I? What is, you know, your answer? So just thinking about that for a minute, because we all certainly do have a multitude of emotions that fluctuate, right? Based on what's happening around each of us. And remember, it's not about good or bad. Right? It's about feel what we need to. Oftentimes what that challenge becomes is we label our emotions as good or bad, but they really just are what they are. Most certainly, We'd rather feel, you know, happy and have fun, but we all know that we've got the sad moments, the frustration and the anger that, again, they're not bad, but we do need to deal with them and express them as healthily as we can. So our mental health, really, that involves striking a balance in various aspects of our life. So if you think about, hmm, what is my ability to enjoy my day to day. How resilient am I? And I will talk about resilience better in a couple minutes. As well as the balance that I try to, you know, maintain in my life, kind of that, uh, you know, up and down, is it really like that teeter totter that or that scale that's really tipping? Or can I be somewhat in the middle with my thoughts and feelings and how I go about my day to day. And how about self actualization? And if you're not familiar with that term, that's really about how each of us reach our full potential. And if that sounds maybe a little bit familiar to you, you may have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, you know, that's something that we, um, we study that's often, uh, you know, covered in classes like this and specifically psychology courses. And Maslow with the pyramid talked about our foundational needs being those basics of food and water and shelter. And then of course, our safety needs and also our belonging or relationship needs, right? Because all of those are pieces of who we are and vital, they're very important for positive mental health. Then respect and esteem needs, both from ourselves and others. And I just want to mention that for a minute when I highlighted ourself and others. 
because if you haven't already reflected and noticed this, I'd encourage you to. We actually tend to be quite critical, the most critical of number one, right, of ourselves. We place shoulds on it. We have expectations that aren't always realistic. So if we can, you know, again, step back and see, hmm, am I being reasonable with myself in what my scenario is? Or am I thinking that I should do and know things that actually, you know, how would I be able to? And then that gets us to the top of the pyramid or that self-actualization piece when we realize our full potential. So no matter what our upbringing, you know, our life experiences, our education, that fluctuates, doesn't it? I have um, a psychology background and specifically grief and bereavement specialty as well. But I always remember when I talk about this type of thing, somebody complimenting me when I decided to do my life coaching accreditation, you know, they said, you know, oh, that's just so you, you've got it all together, that type of thing. And I accepted the compliment and I thought it was very nice. But realistically, I wouldn't say any of us always have it all together. I know that I certainly don't. So just wanting to normalize that piece as well, even realizing our full potential, right? We can strive to give it our all, but life means pieces that are not always totally fitting together like that perfect puzzle. Flexibility is certainly part of our mental fitness as well. So you see here on the screen at the bottom, it talks about various aspects of our life, right? There is the emotional and, and mental health piece, but our mental health also entails being social as we decide, you know, what that looks like for us, as well as our physical health and being active, our spiritual self as well. However, we might define that too. And then of course, the economic piece matters as well. So many things that make up our mental. And I meant the word resilience, right? And that certainly can and does change over the course of our life. And especially when things happen, and we're faced with challenging, maybe unanticipated situations, right? Such as a diagnosis. Because we're not born with, you know, a fixed level of capacity where we'll always just stay. But if we can allow ourselves to be open enough to learn and grow and recognize that an improvement is part of our journey rather than we thinking we need to do or know it all that certainly serves us so so well so having coping skills so we're able to be our best selves even in the face of adversity that's really what resilience is about and so as I say that, I'd like to invite you for a moment, and if you have a piece of paper and pen or pencil in front of you, you might draw this, and if not, you can just imagine it. But I'd like you to picture a dinner plate or draw that plate. And think about or write down what is on your plate. You know, perhaps you have responsibilities of a young family perhaps it's a lot about your own health you know maybe you have a job there could be lots of household responsibilities perhaps you're a volunteer right on and on I'll just silence for a moment so you can further reflect and write down what's applicable to you So as we think about 
perhaps write about what we've got in our day to day. There tends to be lots for many of us, even on what we might call normal circumstances, right? And when we're well. And adding, you know, a diagnosis to that, being presented, you know, with there being cancer and there being extra health needs, that can be large in itself. So whatever your plate is looking like, I'd just like you to do your best to have an objective view of that. And if it seems like your plate is full, perhaps too full, overflowing, is there something, even one small thing, that you can remove from it for the time being? And if it's not something that you know, can just go, is there something that you could delegate somewhere else? As I work with individuals and groups, I find that very often we like to be so independent, whatever our journey is. And we don't want to burden others with asking for help. But maybe in this situation, you need to. And I've discovered that there's very often a person or people who want to help and they don't see it as a burden at all. Instead, they see it as a gift to be able to lend a hand, just like the majority of us do when the role is reversed. And I point that out, you know, you might think, well, yeah, that's really logical because it is, but I'm mentioning that because how many of us really struggle with asking or with accepting, first of all, that I'm not able to do everything that I was before, or I just have too much. It doesn't mean that we're not resilient, right? We can become overwhelmed with tasks and responsibilities and with care and even being creative. Perhaps there's someone in your household and or in your circle who you know, is kind of sitting back, even thinking that you're able to do all what you're doing. And maybe they're not recognizing or yes, some people are a bit on the, uh, you know, the, the not so motivated, lazier side that they could help. Or maybe it's that you're recognizing you could help someone else. Right, just to, again, make this puzzle fit together more effectively, because we can get into the day to day and not always do that stepping back and just get into that mode. And ideally, if before we become angry and resentful, we can kind of regroup and have those conversations that will benefit all of us. And again, that seems so logical, but as recently as last night, I had a conversation with somebody, right? That that's not what's been happening. Um, maybe it's a bit of a hard discussion, but normally it's a very worthwhile investment in ourselves as well as those that were in relationship and who else this involves. Because we all do have stress lives, don't we? And we use that word stress or, you know, I, I'm just not sure I can take on anymore. I'm so stressed out, those types of things. So what is stress really? Stress is actually our body's response to a threat, or maybe it's not an actual threat, but at least a perceived threat, something that is coming at us and, you know, we're uncertain how we might deal with it. So it's ready, meant to get us ready for action and, you know, perhaps even what we might consider as danger. That's how our body is responding. As much as our bodily stress response is often fight, flight, or freeze. So, you know, be present and kind of, you know, let's, let's go with this. Let's do what we can or flight. Let's kind of run away from it or freeze because we're not sure what to do at all. Many that we're faced with 
aren't something that we can either fight or run away from because they may be beyond our control, at least partially, right? Some of the circumstances that we'd like to be able to do something about or flee, we can't. So we need to face them. And this is why we need to recognize that it's something that we need to work through. And I find that I often hear the language of um, individuals to be, you know, I just want to get over this type thing. And that could be illness, loss, other life transitions. And, you know, I understand that, but yet I like to think of that deeper and make sure others recognize that it's not normally, you know, just about getting over something, but it does take effort, right? We need to work through situations. We need to face them head on, which again, I'm not going to say it's just easy, but it's very helpful and necessary for us as we go on this journey. And talking about that as well, you'll see on the screen now lots, but I wanted to just explain this briefly. This diagram is called our window of tolerance, okay? So many things we know can affect us, right? So we could be hyper aroused. In other words, just feel very anxious, even angry, out of control, right? I just can't do this. I just don't want to. And this is where I want to, you know, fight or run. When we're dysregulated, that's when we, you know, start to go outside of what we can tolerate. And we feel anxious, perhaps very agitated, maybe even angry. And as I say this, you're probably thinking of situations, you know, where this is applicable to you. When we're dysregulated, we don't feel comfortable, but we're not out of control like we are when we're so hyper aroused. And that's probably what's happening. And you can see the little diagrams are meant to, you know, explain. And, um, you know, there may be some very difficult feelings and words at the dysregulation stage, but hyper arousal, it's like that, you know, explosion, I just can't take any more. So ideally, though, we want to be in the window of tolerance. There's different ways to explain this, but I like this particular diagram because as you see, the thought is our window as a river and we're floating down that river. But when the river narrows, it becomes more quick, right? It's faster moving water and unsafe. But when it widens, it goes slower and we feel more calm, relaxed, and that we have control. Maybe you're even envisioning yourself, if you've done this before, or perhaps you haven't, right? Tubing down a river. And there's calm parts, and then there's others, you know, that there's, um, you know, quick moving water and rapids. But when the water is not moving as quickly, we are able to function more optimally. More, more effectively. And when we have challenges, we're able to work with them more effectively. But since we all do have stress and trauma, that's what caused our people to be smaller. Like on the left, where it's got those arrows going inward. But on the right, the green arrows, that's showing how we can make that window wider, right? We're expanding it. Not to say even in these situations that there's no stress, of course, but it's how we're responding to it. Maybe we're doing things like meditation, listening to music that's very relaxing and enjoyable, or having hobbies help us with that you know talking communicating with others to express ourselves so what we're feeling isn't so heavy 
And we want and need to do these things because if we're at the top and we get dysregulated to the point of hyper arousal or at the bottom, dysregulated, overwhelmed and our body might want to, you know, shut down and just lose track of time and just, you know, not really face what we need to because that is only temporary as well, right? If someone is just, you know, wanting to sleep and, and not face the day, when they wake up, those problems are still there, aren't they? And then hypoarousal, that is to the point of an abnormal state of decreased responsiveness where we feel very numb, just so exhausted and depressed and normally the reason we get depressed it could be because of a chemical imbalance but it's very often because things in our life are out of balance and i just want to add here as well if you are depressed or have experienced that before i'd encourage you to look at it this way it may sound odd but if we can embrace our feelings, even embrace our depression. We so often spend so much energy and time trying to not feel what we need to feel. Okay. So I say that may sound odd because, you know, embracing our depression, pardon, I don't want to feel like that. But what I'm saying is if we can be with these emotions, okay that gets us further than trying to continuously fight them off. So I hope this diagram, again, makes some sense to you in that this right of what we can tolerate, ideally, we want to do what we're able to widen it, to make that tolerance expand as much as we're able so we can function more effectively. And now I just want to, as we're talking about these various pieces, I want to go specifically into some things that are directly related to, you know, why you're attending tonight. And Teresa shared with me that there were some, you know, questions. These seem to be some common topics when, you know, speaking with bladder cancer patients and loved ones. So these questions and concerns were submitted in advance. I don't want to um, have any inference that this applies to all of you because it certainly may not, but this is, you know, these are situations that are very common. So I just encourage you to take what is applicable in your situation. Okay. So we know that with a diagnosis, there often is anxiety of recurrence. And, you know, is this going to be a lifelong disease? And the early stages of bladder cancer, zero to one, are always when it's, you know, kind of that middle part, the stage two and three, treatment is still a possibility, most definitely, but the treatment is normally more radical, okay? There's more involved with it. Metastatic or stage four cancer is less likely to be treatable, and it is known that the cancer can come back. So wanting to acknowledge this, as well as the waiting for tests and results that can cause further stress and anxiety. So I'll go over, you know, the questions and concerns that were submitted then um, once I do that, get more into what we hope are some helpful suggestions and navigate wherever you're at on this journey. Something else that was noted was certainly the traumatic procedures and after effects as well. And with that being said, most definitely, the medical procedures can most certainly create added anxiety. And there may be unknowns of, you know, what this will mean for your body and what the recovery time will be. 
our doctors providing lots of details and uh, you know as much information as they can, perhaps, or maybe more detailed information needs to be requested. And there even needs to be a little bit further um, with advocacy for yourself or your family member, which you may be able to, um, you know, do that alone and have good direction. But I think uh, we're certainly fortunate to have Bladder Cancer Canada for that type of support and reassurance assistance in uh, navigating whatever that looks like for you, as well as body processes that may change and you know there may be lots of awareness and education what you know will will change within the body but not necessarily and we do know that treatments can affect sexuality in different ways for both men and women okay so another piece that you may be concerned about as well and even the uncertainty of what is bladder cancer and if this is reality, to not be hesitant to ask your medical team questions, you know, perhaps in the busyness of their role or even um, erroneously being presumptuous, right, that you know something or perhaps there was information shared that you forgot would be to ask those questions, write things down. Again, our friends here with Bladder Cancer Canada just seek out that information as well. And looking up information online can also be um, a, a key piece of this and very helpful, um, just ensuring, of course, that it is reputable because we do know as well that some information isn't um, as accurate as we would like. So being able to decipher that and when there is uncertainty, reaching out for clarification and support. Maybe hesitation and not desiring to share with family and others. Maybe feeling that, you know, it's just such a burden and it will create such overwhelm. There also might be the concern that, you know, whenever I talk to someone, People just say, I'm sorry, or they have so much pity for me, and that's not what I want either. So how do we deal with these types of concerns? It might not always feel like open communication is really beneficial or what we want to do. But in my experience with, you know, illness situations, other life transitions where we seem to be just climbing uphill, um, you know, when it is about death situations as well, it's always helpful to have those honest conversations to support one another. And even though we can't make things better, the heaviness diminishes, right? It's not felt so much only inside of you as one person. There can be, you know, true support and empathy where others understand, perhaps others can even empathize very closely. Yes, we're all different in how we feel, but some others' experiences may be very motivating for you, very reassuring, right? That you're just not alone. And when you feel like there's, you know, uh, people are well-meaning and they, they try to be supportive, but, you know, they're kind of not on the mark. I kind of coined the phrase to be a, a leader in our journey asking for what we need, accepting that support, but also let others know what you're feeling, okay? Again, this is not for all of us. The last couple of days, um, my aunt let us know that uh, unfortunately, um, you know, her tumors have now been, um, it's been determined there's metastases in the brain. So we know, right, that there's so much to think about. And as much as you know, family may just run there. She doesn't have children. So a few of us nieces are our closest. You know, we also know that a lot of times for her, it's about processing first, right? And so we've said that most definitely for her to let us know what she needs, that we want to give her space, but we're also so available. And I only use that personal example because that's something that, um, you know, I've learned and other people may want you there immediately, right? So doing what someone wants 
as best they can communicate. And if they're not sure, maybe it will be more about others, you know, helping them um, with those decisions. But for individuals to recognize what's most suitable for them. And when we're on this journey, the sleep loss can be truly challenging as well. Not the magic wand that we'd love to have to just make that better either, but consistency in a sleep schedule. And, you know, if it's difficult to sleep at night, then maybe no napping during the day, perhaps just resting and avoiding certain things, right? Like caffeine, um, limiting alcohol, if having any at all. Maybe it's about light meals and, and snacks instead of heavy ones. And as much as exercise is always very good, and we know that it impacts our mental health in a positive way to not do heavy exercise later on in the day, right? To do that earlier on so we can um, hopefully sleep better. And if you're not so familiar with how come physical movement is good for our mental well-being, that's because um, the endorphins, the serotonin, those feel-good chemicals inside of us, their level naturally heightens when we move, okay? And our cortisol levels are the stress hormone that decreases when we're active. Mindfulness and meditation, always very good as well. And focusing on, you know, our tendency to ruminate, to go over and over that same thing in our mind. Maybe we can have time of writing and worrying earlier in the day. Perhaps there are meditation and mindfulness exercises that we've come up with ourselves, or maybe online that, you know, you access YouTube, perhaps you'll use an app. Um, calm, headspace, breathe. Those are some apps that I'm familiar with that are um, very much um, helpful. You know, meditation, the pieces that I do want to caution you with, though, is that normally after um, a time period, then, you know, you will be required to to pay for them. So um, just keeping that as mo in mind as well. I'm just writing those in the chat. And when I've looked it up, I haven't used breathe before, but it is spelt with all ease. So um, just just for your information, that's not a, an error there. That's how you would want to look it up. And uh, rumination, again, that's going over and over what we're faced with. It's tough to shut off the mind, isn't it? But if we can do things like focusing on the person's voice as we're doing a mindfulness exercise, for example, as, as we're meditating. And also I want to point out that mindfulness is not only engaging in meditative practices. It's also being very intentional to notice things and situations without judgment, right? Often those voices in our mind can be very negative, but just to intentionally notice and appreciate, and that can really do a great deal for enhancing our quality of life as well. And when I say grounding techniques, if you're not sure what that's all about, we all sit, stand or lay, you know, in, in a position and have access to things. Right now I'm sitting at a desk. If so if I were to do a grounding exercise, I could, for example, touch the desk or I could touch my sweater. I could touch the couch beside me. I can listen, right, for noises that, um, you know, are around me. So whatever it is, I can see right outside, trees, flowers, grass, etc. So that all is the purpose of calming through our senses. We can even do that with taste. Perhaps you have a mint or gum or something in your mouth, you taste that. Or maybe it was the last thing that you ate or drank. And Teresa, you've just taught me something, Insight Timer, I haven't heard of that one. That's the beauty of doing these things because I always learn something new as well. So thank you for um, letting us know about that meditation app also. It may be embarrassing or you feel guilty. Perhaps you're thinking, you know, I, I should have thought this sooner, but should you have? Was there any way, you know, to know that this is what you were facing? Often, not so much, right? 
cancer at times can be preventable, but isn't always. And we're human. So, you know, we're not always certain of what signs and because they're different as well for different people. And even if you were a smoker, you're not alone in that, right? It was something in the past, maybe even started when we didn't know um, the impacts on our bodies. And, you know, I've learned how truly difficult it is to stop. So instead of, you know, being caught up so much in that, recognizing this is where I'm at and asking yourself the question, what will serve me most well in order for me to, you know, be with what I'm faced with, even with the choices that I've made. Focus objectively, I'm suggesting, rather than being too harsh or judgmental. Because like I said earlier, we're very often so hard on ourselves, right? And if you've heard that statement that we play shoulds on ourselves or others, and you recognize you do that, you know, remember this, we don't want to should on ourselves. And if that sounds like something else, that's really what it is, right? So instead of saying, you know, I should have known, well, unfortunately, I did not know, but I will do what I'm able to make different, perhaps more positive decisions from here. And if you have, you know, survivor guilt, or you always are thinking, you know, others have it worse, or, you know, I just don't want to be that cancer page. Maybe there's some things that you need to allow yourself to grieve because they are different in life now. To be frustrated, to be sad, to just, uh, you know, be where you need to be with your emotions. Maybe you need to write extensively or even just words or sentences. Perhaps scribbling is helpful for you or writing something and crumpling the page or ripping it to shreds just to have that release. As long as it's safe, that's what we want. And if there is someone that you're remembering who has died, what can you do positively in remembrance of them? Something that they loved to do, maybe, you know, a cake or something that was a favorite to, to make and eat or donate in one's honor. Offering a kind gesture to someone who's helped in your journey, or is there a stress reliever that you'd just like to explore or go back to? When we say exercise, it doesn't need to be really strenuous either, but just to have that movement. Music, maybe it's listening, perhaps even writing, or if you have the ability or want to learn a bit, you know, playing a certain song. I've been taught over the last probably year and a half, a lot of my clients have started doing diamond art. You know, the little stones that they carefully put on the page where they're to be placed and then make a beautiful picture. So it may be that, painting, knitting, et cetera, whatever you find is helpful. Support groups and or professional help. Again, we can't just have all the answers, but the way that support helps. And I've been very privileged to witness that in different facets where, you know, we go to groups and there's just conversation and emotions and feelings shared. And even though it just doesn't make things all better, the lightness and the positivity as a result are, are really amazing, really something to be grateful for. And as I say that, yes, most definitely sharing feelings rather than suppressing. Often it's about a small circle of very trusted support. Doing that in such a way that makes you just feel, you know, that you're supported, that you're loved, that somebody is hearing you. And that's regardless other factors. We do tend to find that more females seek out support groups than males become, you know, when we are talking about gender differences, males tend to have more, um, you know, maybe action oriented and to build and things like that. But certainly for everyone to be most welcome and hopefully recognize the value in sharing as they need to and not be judged for that as well.
So working through uncertainty, because that's a lot about what this is, feeling what we feel, being patient with ourselves, and not expecting ourselves to be strong for others. I so often hear, you know, that phrase, well, I've always been the rock of our family, so I can't share. But, hmm, let's look at that as well. The rock of your family. Well, rocks do crumble as well, right? Rocks can be moved. So if we can all recognize our humanness again and not expect that strength means that we you know, can't have tears or, or shouldn't share. Focusing on our quality of life, making the most of our time and surrounding ourselves with what we feel are positive and life-giving things. Not only other people who are happy, pets, you know, planting a garden, um, other activities that are just helpful and enjoyable for you. And accept that our emotions can really fluctuate even in a small amount of time. One moment we may be feeling okay, and the next it may be, you know, that our heart strings have really been pulled on because of something we're thinking about, perhaps something someone else says or does. But also it may be that you uh, need to tell your family, because we do tend to live in somewhat of a fix-it society, you know, that when you are emotional, that's, it's not a bad thing, right? Many of us can laugh and cry at basically the same time. And, you know, telling others, please don't stop talking with me and visiting, even when I'm emotional, is just something helpful and important for me to do. And that being said, to maintain friendships, especially with those who understand and listen and do what we call hold the space if you need it or maybe you're the person holding the space for others that normally others aren't looking for answers right normally or are we but to be heard to be listened to and that's why it may be maintaining friendships or perhaps there's new ones to be made with someone you coincidentally meet, um, go to a support group with, et cetera. So that openness for that positivity and life-giving nature. This screen and the next just lists the stories a little bit further that I've already done. Um, you can see that many of these you perhaps do or have done, but just to highlight them, especially if you've forgotten about them or haven't thought of them, okay? Maybe there will be some invitations that you accept or others you say no, or perhaps it just needs to be on your terms, depending, you know, on your energy level, how you're feeling. If someone's having, say, a five-hour event, maybe you can find healthy balance and not just saying no, but not going the whole time either, perhaps just attending for a couple of hours. And laughter, that old saying, right, laughter is the best medicine, if we can still have that in our life. I actually get concerned when I think about, uh, you know, laughter at times and I'm thinking, yeah, maybe it's time I even uh, look at my own self. I don't know how many times I laugh or smile a day, but when I read a study years ago that said kids laugh and smile hundreds of times a day and adults only tend to like, you know, 15 to 25 times or something. So just, you know, being mindful of our own selves. And at times we even think, we shouldn't laugh, but there is appropriateness and value in that as well. Continue with more healthy coping strategies. I think lists are always good on a normal day for some of us anyway, um, but perhaps more as our, you know, needs have, have become, uh, you know, heightened. And to ask questions, I mentioned accepting help and keeping things as simple as we can, as well as recognizing our limits. For some, it's about religious strength. Others, it's more spiritual or perhaps a combination. Whatever your belief system and what speaks to you. And I find that a gratitude list to help us, you know, in our day to day. Never to minimize the tough stuff we're going through, but also to keep in perspective what we have and what we are able to do is again, positive and life-giving. I'm aware of the time and I'm not going to just list all the self-care ideas. I'll you know, certainly um, allow you to uh, just take a moment to review them. 
and I'm certainly open to sharing the presentation as well, but to make sure that we invest in ourselves with even small doses of self-care each day. Doesn't have to be expensive, right? Doesn't have to be elaborate. Might even be picking up the phone to have a conversation instead of texting or just sitting and breathing deeply. Because when we don't practice self-care, that doesn't serve us well either. Our energy levels are affected and our levels of feeling hopeful become less, right? We become hopeless, often less patient and you know, maybe just feeling burnt out and strained. So I've mentioned judgment and being very connected with what needs are. Can never underestimate the value of communication and listening. I guess I've kind of already said this, it's not about fixing the situation. So as you'll see here, the point to the far right on the bottom, one of my pieces that I learned from early, one of my early mentors, the gift of presence, the reality of being present for someone and very sensitive. And yes, talking some, but we tend to, you know, talk and talk more, but being silent and listening, very in tune to what someone else needs. And just this quote here talks about um, from John Lennon, when I was five, my mother told me happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I want to be when I grew up. So I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment, but I told them they didn't understand life. To me, that was a thought provoking one that I had forgotten about, where if we can again make that difference for each of us and find that happiness and looking into our own heart to help awaken, you know, what still is alive inside of us through our supporting others, or even when our health becomes compromised. Appreciating where we are in our journey, even if it's not where we want to be. And I truly believe this as well, that each season does have a purpose, as Annie Dillard said. And this is when we can really think about, right, that mindfulness aspect and appreciating every season. I find even in the cold of winter, there can be so much beauty because life is short. So asking yourself questions such as these, what makes my life worth living? What's missing? Where are the answers? How will I be remembered? What do I dream of? What's my passion, my fire within? For each of us to live and love, and of course, continuously learn and then leave our legacy. And it ends with life is short. So, question mark, because we have the opportunity to fill in that blank, right? To steer ourselves or our boat in that direction that we desire as much as possible. And shifting our perspective who I can, even if it's a struggle, is most beneficial, as Mona Delahook told us as well. Lastly, to finish up, I apologize that, goodness, it's almost eight o'clock, so much to say. I hope you found some value in this. For me, I have a couple of songs that I consider to be my theme songs in life. So I'm just giving you this example of Hero by Mariah Carey where she describes the power that lies in each of us and our ability to be our own hero. And I also love I Hope You Dance by Leanne Womack, right? She talks about facing our challenges and making the most of every day. So perhaps you'll choose these or other songs to help get you through the tough moments, hours, and days. And as things are challenging, that you will still find bright lights in the midst of 
your gray or dark days. So that is what I have to say. Um, I will just before I um, stop screen sharing show you that um, there also is the opportunity for contact information um, of mine on here, as well as filling out a survey. So when you, um, you know, if, if you're able to do this, we'd certainly love to have your feedback. But I will stop sharing in case there's any questions or comments at all. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sonia. Those were really powerful tools. Um, for our community to maintain their mental health and and a nice reminder that you know all of these feelings are very common and and normal so um thank you so we will open the floor to questions i know it's eight o'clock but um i think it, it's really important to have the opportunity for a little bit of q a so um if anyone has a question feel free to um write it in the chat and i can read it out to to sonia um we did have one question come in about um as a caregiver if you see that your loved one is, you know, struggling with their mental health and they don't want to get support, what, uh, what should you do? Yes, that's a tough one too, isn't it? And yes, some people will be like that as much as we wish that, um, you know, that wasn't the reality. I would certainly encourage, um, you know, not, not knowing what their capabilities or their openness is, but as much as possible, maybe some of the things that I've suggested here, they may engage in, right? Even if they don't want to get support, will they, you know, do some right, be more connected with music? And, you know, some people too don't believe in professional support, but they will talk to yourself or others. We certainly encourage that all of us do our best to keep ourselves well. If that's something that is getting overwhelming for you as the caregiver, maybe there's a few of you who could be those support people as well. Um, so, you know, whatever ways that someone is even a little bit open, you know, maybe they'll, um, you know, be that person who, it may not be extensive writing, say, but would they write down even a couple of things that they're grateful for in that day, or read an inspirational verse every morning or evening, okay? I hope that's a bit helpful, even small things um, that can make some difference, you know, those little big things, as we call them, I hope will be helpful. If you want to ask further, um, if that doesn't uh, fit the bill, please do. And I'll, I'll further think about that as well. We hope you enjoyed this session and um, we will be taking a break from webinars in the summer, um, but we'll be back in the fall with some great sessions on men's health, women's health and clinical trials. Um, you saw in the chat, I did just share a quick feedback survey that will come through email as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the session, suggestions for future pres presentations. So please take a few minutes to complete that. And if you need accommodations to complete the survey, or if you have any additional comments or questions, you're always welcome to call us at 1-866-674-8889 or email info at bladdercancercanada.org. A recording of this session will be uploaded to our website in the coming weeks. So um, please check back if you'd like to share it with anyone else. So thank you again, Sonia McMahon, Co-Martin, and the Canadian Mental Health Association of Windsor-Essex for this empowering session. And thank you to everyone for attending. I hope you have a great night. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.